Hello, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm here with Luis Serrano, who is the head of developer relations at Cohere, as well as he's pretty well known for his YouTube channel, Serrano Academy, which I'm guessing most of you are familiar with. Uh, if not, you should definitely check it out. And I'm Salwa Nur Mohammed, the founder and CEO of Fourth Brain. Um, Luis and I go way back, so I'm really excited to have him here today. He has a pretty um, impressive resume, I'd say. I'm not going to read off of it, but he's been involved in quantum AI research at Zapata Consult Computing recently, um, as well as various education initiatives at Apple, Udacity, and Google. So welcome, Luis, and I'm going to let you take it away as you tell us more about how LLMs can be used for business, and we'll follow along. Thank you so much, Salwa. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, with you and uh, and Molly. Uh, we, we do go way back to a time at Udacity when you were the VP, and I was making content there. So it's it's nice to to follow yeah. it uh, at at Fort Payne. It's, uh, it's a great place. That has great uh, education and initiatives. So yes, I'm I'm very happy to be here, and uh, thank you for, to everybody who's uh, joining. As, as a matter of fact, I'm going to share my screen. Um, Now you see my screen here, right? I'm gonna share my presentation. Perfect. Uh, and I actually see, ah, this is great because I did have my first question was, hello, where are you joining us from? And I see that people are already joining. It's uh, Alejandro's from Mexico and uh, Abur who's from Istanbul, and Minneapolis, Monterey. Uh, so great, yeah, just feel, feel free to let us know where, where you're joining us from. Uh, I, I live in, in Toronto, I'm originally from Colombia, but I am, uh, I am in Toronto, Canada right now and very happy to talk to you about large language models. So as I said, I see the chat. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Some of them will be answered right away. Some of them will be flagged for answering later. And there's a lot of people from everywhere. Uh, India, Spain, Chad, Pakistan, South Africa, Toronto, Germany, Ngaluru, UK. Wow, that's amazing. I'm so glad that we're, we're all over the place, Philippines, Nigeria. Um, so yeah, as, as, as super happy to, to join you here. We have both channels, right? We have the fourth main channel and, and my channel, uh, as well. So let me start talking about LLMs. Uh, so, you know, un unless you've been living under a rock, you, you must be aware of this, uh, this amazing, uh, new, new, new thing, uh, pretty much every 10 to 15 years, something huge happens in technology, right? We have the personal computer. Then the internet, uh, web browsers, then mobile, uh, cell phones, uh, mobile apps, and now generative chat is, is definitely the the uh, the thing. Uh, it, it's definitely revolutionizing the way we uh, interact with computers because now we can actually talk to them in our language and they talk to us back. So it it, it breaks a huge barrier um, that we used to have before. So basically, at what what comes from this is 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 huge and this is we're just basically scratching the surface uh this is probably what you've been seeing you know we we talk to the computer and then the computer talks back so it's kind of like a a brain that uh just listens and then talks back i kind of want to dispel this notion and make one small change here which is instead of one brain we have two brains so the brains are one that understands and one that talks back. So the, the understanding part of the language and the generation part of the language. And if you were, uh, you know, uh, around in, uh, in looking at AI 10 years ago, uh, this is uh, understanding is what was big. You know, when we started to understand that the computer was happy or sad, if, if, the, if, the, if the sentence was happy or sad, or if it referred to spam or not, or if the image had a dog or not. Remember like when, when, when these started coming up and, and we were amazed, uh, and now we have the generation, which is even even more amazing. Uh, so so those are the two, and I'll tell you a little more later about the uh, Cohere endpoints. At, at Cohere, I'll, I'll tell you more. But we have a, a bunch of uh, endpoints that you can use with API that are embed, cluster, rank, classify, generate, chat, summarize, and and rag. Uh, I'll mention. I think I'll mention like half of them or or more in, in this in this talk. Um, but basically, all of them are either language understanding, like embed, clustery rank, or generation, like generate chat, summarize, uh, et cetera. And I'm going to start with uh, what I think is the most important thing 
which is embed. Embed is really the, the bread and butter of large language models. It's, it's really where the rubber meets the road. And what is embed? Well, it's something that turns words into numbers. And why is that so important? Because humans, we speak in words and computers, they speak in numbers. So whatever we do, we have to translate at some point. And the better this translation is, the better this bridge is, the better that the, the better things we can do. So like if, if somebody comes up with a better embedding tomorrow, all language models will be better immediately because it's it's really where the translation um, happens. And uh, basically it's, it's a word gets sent to a bunch of numbers and some really nice, um, and some really nice uh, uh, properties that they have. Uh, I'm looking at the chat and some brings from Tatooine. Wow, <laughs> nice. Um, all right, so um, here is a quiz for you, right? And the quiz is you're gonna help me, so please put your answers in the in the comments. Uh, I'm gonna locate a bunch of words in the plane. So on the top left, you know, I have some tennis ball, soccer ball, basketball, and the bottom I have houses, castles. Then bottom right we have a, a bike and a car. And on top we have a strawberry, banana, etc. And the question that I have for you is very easy, but I but I want you to 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 just interact. Uh, where would you put the word apple? Right? Would you put it in A, B, or C, or D? So I take answers from the from the comments. Would you put it in A, B, uh, C, or D? And obviously there can be more than one answer, but there's you know there's one I'm I'm going for. Uh, but yeah, please please go ahead and and answer. So I hear top right. Yes, I see a C. Um, yeah, I see a bunch of C's, and that's kind of what I was thinking too. I would put the apple in C. And uh, yeah, I see I see other suggestions as well. So a lot of things are valid, but um, I would do C. Why, why would I do C? The reason why I would do C is because, uh, yeah, I see Quentin Quarantino has a really good, um, that's a good name, uh, a, a good um, uh, suggestion, which is A, because it's round. So yeah, we can start seeing that embeddings have ambiguities, right? So it could, it could be, it could be A because it's round, but let's go for C because it's a fruit. Uh, like most of uh, people say. And the reason it's a fruit, it, and the reason it's, it's C is because it's a fruit and we kind of want fruits to stick together. You know, if I had a, a pickup truck, it would go close to the vehicles. And if I had an, an apartment, it would go close to the houses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's one property of embeddings, right? And why am I saying that words go to numbers? Because here there's two numbers for each location, right? It's the, the horizontal coordinate and the vertical coordinate. So if cherry is 52 on the X axis and horizontal axis and 24 on the vertical axis and, and apple would be 50 and 25 and then house is 10 and four. So you can see the first property of embeddings, right? Which is that, um, that similar uh, things go to uh, similar numbers. And I don't have to have two. I can have words going to a thousand. A thousand twenty four is actually the, the latest embedding we have at Cohere has a thousand twenty four numbers for every word. And and the ones for Apple are similar to the ones for pair and very similar to very different to the ones for car and truck and and, and building and, and all that. So these embeddings are very uh very important. They take a lot of building them takes a lot of a lot of work. Uh, but luckily, they're already there, so you can you can start using them, right? You can use. I can give you a demo later of, of uh, an embedding, but you can actually start plugging them in and and doing your your models with with these really good embeddings. Um, somebody did point it out. Uh, we we already started seeing the ambiguities here, right? Because Apple could also be round. Um, so here, let's actually let's actually have another quiz. This quiz shows a little bit of the ambiguities of an embedding. I have on the top right a bunch of fruits and on the bottom left a bunch of uh, technology brands or technology words. I have Windows, Android, I have a phone and, uh, and that thing is a laptop. Um, where would you put the word Apple now? In A, B or C? So I, I take I take answers in the chat in the in the in the chat uh, now. Would it be would the would Apple go at A, B or C? All of a sudden got a little harder. Right. Uh, Devin has a question. It says, "Do vector closeness means cosine similarity?" Yes, yes, it would be cosine similarity. In this talk, I'm going to pretend it's distance uh, because at the end, 
you know, the higher the distance, the lower the cosine similarity, but yeah, it would be cosine similarity. So we have a lot of answers, uh, A or C or B. Some people say A and C and some people say B. Some people say A, some people say C. So the answer is if, if we can't figure it out, neither neither can the embedding, right? Like it, it would it could go on C because it's a fruit. It could go on A because it's a technology word uh, or it could go on B because it's undecided. But this shows that embeddings are not perfect, right? Embeddings have their own problems, which is sometimes words mean two things and the embedding has no clue where to send them because they mean two things. Um, so let's just pretend that we put it in B. Uh, and so the question is, what can we do to, to know what I'm talking about? If I'm, if I say the word Apple, what, if I just stand up and say Apple, what did I mean? And then the, what we need now is context, right? If I say Apple by itself, you don't know what I'm saying. But if I say Apple unveiled this new phone, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the brand. If I say buy an apple and an orange, I'm probably talking about a fruit. So context pulls, right? And quite literally context pulls because what happens here is that the word apple gets pulled by the word orange and the word apple uh, here gets pulled by the word phone. It actually gets pulled by all of them, but, but one particularly pulls them. And I imagine this is gravity. I imagine this like, like basically you have a, a, a bunch of fruits here and the orange actually pulls the apple and moves it towards it. So now we change the numbers for the apple. The coordinates are different for this apple. Now they're like closer to the orange. And if we do this many times, the apple's gonna move to the fruits. And uh, if we're talking about the phone, then the phone pulls the apple there. So we're changing the embedded, the numbers uh, that we use because the, 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 every model will use not the word apple, but the, the coordinates that it has. And so if we, move it to gravitate it toward the words that are there. So for example, if I've been talking about fruits for hours, I have a really strong galaxy of fruits here. And if I say apple, well, that gets pulled back to the fruit. So, you know, I'm talking about the fruit. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate too much. This is, this is called the tension mechanisms. It's, it's really what made language models work. I see some good con con questions. What about a Blackberry? I think it's the same thing. Um, actually, somebody pointed out to me that Orange is a, is a brand of, of phones and uh, of, uh, telecommunications in, in Europe, so that I have to change that example too. But I feel like the ambiguity is too, it, it is too much here, so we have to kind of pretend uh, that things are more simple. Um, anyway, this is called an attention mechanism. This gravitational thing is called an attention mechanism. And this is really what made transformers work so well, you know, because a few years ago we had models that would, would be able to, to find the next word in a sentence, but they're very simple. They didn't really carry context. Attention is what made the, these models carry context. Um, and uh, this is a, the architecture of an attention model, you know, the, the Cohere model, the ChatGPT, and uh, any, of, any of those uh, models has pretty much this architecture where here you can see the embeddings, right? The embeddings that I told you, uh, the, 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 the plane. Uh, here you can see attention happening a bunch of times. And here you see a neural network. So a neural net, this neural network, basically, I won't, I won't say much about it, but I'll give you a reference pretty soon. Uh, but this pretty much is what, what we've seen for a long time. You know, when you go on your text messages and you type, hello, how are, and it suggests the next word, uh, that's pretty much the neural network that, that is used in transformers of most, much bigger, but it just finds, it just guesses the next word that's coming in the sentence. Uh, now those don't work really well, but if you, if you pad them with with embedding and attention and 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 a bunch of things, then then they start working really well, and that's a transformer. Basically, it just guesses one word at a time, uh, and and it can form a huge story, a huge everything, but one word um, at a time. I see a question by Khaled. Does the embedding train separately? Yes, they are they are trained separately. They're they're trained uh, in a, in many different in several different ways but yeah they are they are trained separately and used here and they can be used in many other applications as a matter of fact today i'm not going to talk about transformers fully i'm going to talk about search where embeddings get used um but i just dropped a single today in my in my channel uh so this is a great time for uh for for joining this trans transformer models if you go to my channel there's a transformer models where i explain all the stuff about transformers in detail there's actually three videos there's two on attention and one on transformers so you know it'll uh It'll give you all the information you need on the on the channel Serrano uh, Academy. Uh, definitely check it out. Um, and as I said today, I'm not going to talk so much about uh, what transformers do, but I'm going to give you a really cool application, um, which actually uh, is search. But before I get to search, I'm going to tell you 
more about embeddings because embeddings are even cooler than what I just showed you. See, I showed you that a word goes to a bunch of numbers, but not just a word. They're actually called text embeddings. So an entire sentence, an entire paragraph, and even longer stuff can be sent to a bunch of, of numbers. So for example, here, so this is actually, I took a screenshot of the, the, of the demo that I'll give you later, is the Cohere dashboard. You can write sentences and, and make them embed and play with them. I put these four sentences, hello, how are you? Hi, how's it going? Which are similar. And then the car is red, the vehicle is blue, which are similar. You can see similar sentences, right? Even though they don't have the same words. And the embedding picked up that one and two are uh, close to each other and like three and four are close to each other. So you can, you can put longer pieces of text and a good embedding actually sends the piece of text to a bunch of numbers that have the same property. They're similar. Uh, they, they're, they're close if the numbers are similar. And as I said, it's not just two numbers, right? I can sell each, send each sentence to 1,024 numbers. Uh, and they, um, and these things, and these things work like magic. And at the end of the day, um, what I like to see if an embedding is kind of a summarization of, of, of the text, right? Like if I have a sentence and I send it, to 1,024 numbers, it's almost like each number has some a description of something, right? Like if it's a fruit, if it's an apple and it goes, maybe one number tells you about the sweetness and one tells you about the shape and the size, or maybe even properties that the computer knows and, and we can't figure out. But at the end of the day, think of a thousand numbers that describe your thing. So obviously if the thousand numbers that describe an apple and the thousand numbers that describe a pear are probably gonna be similar in some way, right? Um, and this, um, and here's another example, an experiment that I was playing with. I, there, there's a, a huge data set of sentences and I send it to an embedding and this one doesn't have two or, or 1024. It just has 10 numbers. So 10 numbers associated to each sentence and the numbers are seen as shades, right? Big numbers are dark and small numbers are light. And, um, and, uh, then take a look at these two sentences. Show me a list of ground transportation at Boston airport and show me Boston ground transportation. Uh, and they're very similar. And as you can see, the, um, you know, the numbers are pretty close to each other. They're not the same, obviously, but they're, they're, they're very, very close. So you can, you can see that a good embedding sends similar sentences to, to similar numbers, a list of numbers. It's called a vector, actually. Uh, so, um, and that's a line of text. That, that's a line of code. In, in, in the Cohere uh, endpoint, you can just say code.embed and then put in your text and out comes a vector of 1,024 things. Uh, so it's pretty convenient. It's a very powerful, the very powerful models are used for this, but all you have to do is one line of code. Um, yeah, and then there's also a multilingual embedding. There's a multilingual embedding that supports over a hundred languages. And I did an experiment here. I said, hello, how are you? I'm bonjour, ça va, which is the, the French uh, sentence. And then the car is red and l'auto is rojo, which is the, the two, uh, English and Spanish sentences for the same thing. And the model catches that, you know, it sends things in different languages to similar numbers. So it pretty much takes all the languages and translates them to numbers in the same way. So the computer doesn't even care what language you're talking. It just picks up the numbers and it goes, okay, I'm gonna work with these numbers and, you know. Um, so yeah, uh, let me make a small time and see if there's any any questions. Uh, Inigo says those are thousand numbers are dimensions. Yes, they are. Carly says embeddings are good when they get more than three dimensions. My mind blowing up. The same, the same happens to me because I can't visualize them. You can also visualize three dimensions, right? But if you visualize 1024, just a picture words flying around in 1024 uh, dimensions. Uh, Lorenzo says number related to distribution probabilities of words learned during training. Uh, yeah, there, there are some. Um, I would say they're more like properties of the word, but yeah, you can think of things in in terms of product distributions. Um, okay, so let me go to the topic of today, which is uh, search. So let's let's talk about search. Search is very, very important in uh, large language models. And I'm gonna ask you a question just to see if I get a, you know some answers here. Um, how, are you, how would you build a search engine? So why don't you, somebody maybe, uh, Give me an idea of, of how would you build a, a search engine if if I'm if your boss comes in and says, hey, we have 10 minutes. Uh, I need you to build a really quick search engine for our for our documents. Um, how would you 
how would you go about it? And it's obviously a simple answer because you have 10 minutes uh, to do it. So you can't come up with the best uh, search one uh, algorithm, but you know, what's the first thing you would try? Uh, I'm going to answer some questions. Dino says, do you use word to vec Yes, yes, word to vec is used. Keywords, uh, regex, embeddings, and keywords. Wow, you got you got all the, um, you, you, you guessed my talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, have embedding database, convert query to embedding, finds nearest neighbor in database. Wow, you, you, all, you all know a lot. Yes, very, very good job, everybody. Uh, yes, that's, that's what we're going to do. We're gonna do uh, first the suggestions, the first suggestions that I got, which, which are keywords, and then we're gonna use embeddings. So wow, this is a very educated crowd. I see a lot of a lot of uh, great answers. So thank you all. Uh, so let's go with the easy one. Let's go with the um, the keyword search, which is really matching keywords, right? Like I'm gonna take, for example, I'm gonna search Brazil to USA travel visa. This is what I wanna search. Uh, and um, and if I search for something that matches as many words as possible, because that's keyword search, right? I just I just find the answer among an answer database, the one that has the most amount of matching words, and then it gives me USA to Brazil travel visa, uh, which actually matched perfectly because it matched all the words, but it didn't capture the answer because I don't. I didn't, I wasn't looking for USA to Brazil travel visa. I was looking for Brazil to USA travel visa. So the, the perfect answer for keyword search, but then, but a bad answer for, uh, for what I wanted. So instead, uh, I'm going to look at more answers here. Yeah, I, a lot of them vector uh, embedding, uh, algebra, linear algebra, proximity of vectors, ranking stuff. That's actually pretty, pretty good answer. That's coming too. Hashing to embedding. Normalize by projecting to the embeddings, uh, information on true documents. Yeah, you all have great answers. So um, basically what we want is something better than keyword search, right? So what's better than keyword search? Well, something that actually doesn't have to match every single word. It may not even match a single word in my question, but that actually captures the context, right? The semantics. And that would be semantic search. So I'm going to show you what semantic search is. I'm sure a lot of you already imagine um, what what it is. Um, and what it does is it basically embeds the questions and the answers. So it puts them all in an embedding. This is this is the embedding. And obviously, Brazil to USA travel visa and USA to Brazil travel visa are far because they're not the same meaning. A good embedding would capture that that these mean different things, whereas these two are close because even though they don't have the same words, a good embedding will capture that they're both very similar meaning. So it, it puts them close. And then all I have to do is nearest neighbors, right? I just pick I just pick the closest answer and that's my answer. So that's dense retrieval. Dense retrieval pretty much has a bunch of documents and answers or paragraphs or articles in Wikipedia or anything. And uh, it puts them on an embedding and then it puts the question, puts the query and then finds the closest one. And among those, the answer uh, should be in, in principle, right? Um, so super simple example here. I have four sentences. So this is a demo. I, I did it on the on the dash on, on the playground as well at uh, the computer playground. I put the, can the capital of Canada is Ottawa. Apples are red. Galileo invented the telescope. And a square has four sides. That is my uh, data set of answers. And then I have a question, which is what, is what is the capital of Canada? And I embed that, and in the embedding, it goes here. So obviously, the, the closest is the capital of Canada, Ottawa. And so that's my dense retrieval. That's how I found it. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I have a question for you. What could be potential problems with dense retrieval? Let's see what what could be a potential issue. Like uh, this is obviously not not perfect. It's better than keyword search, but when when could it go wrong? Where where could where could dense retrieval go wrong? Victor says meaning speed could be uh, meaning retrieving another query. Jan says yeah, that's uh, those are all correct. Actually, retrieving another query would be the um, a big problem, right? Uh, because it it it. Yeah, slow processing could be too, uh, but it, it, it can be speed up. Limited to the actual knowledge base. Yeah, that could be bad or also could be good, right? Uh, because it could 
you can restrict it to the to what you actually want. Misunderstanding context that can happen. Yeah, false positives to nearest neighbors, biases. Yeah, a lot a lot of great answers. Uh, I'm gonna tell you one one problem with it. Yes, there you go. Uh, the, the, the Kalian, thank you. Uh, similarity is not always the answer. That is that is correct. And and Ali also says dense retrieval looks for the same meaning, but it doesn't necessarily answer the question. There, there you go. Uh, you, you nailed it. Uh, the the closest sentence is not the answer, right? If you if you ask me, you know, what color is an apple, and my answer is what color is an orange, I and mean, well, you say, well, that's not the answer. I say, well, that's the closest sentence, right? Because the closest sentence is not the answer. Uh, and 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 I did a little experiment here where I said the capital of Canada is Ottawa, the capital of Canada is in North America, the capital of USA is Washington, and the capital of Canada is in the moon. Uh, some of them are true, some of them are false, some of them are completely unrelated. Uh, but the fact is that if I put the question, what's the capital of Canada, it can be as close to all of them because it's similar to all of them. And as a matter of fact, the one that was closest was the capital of Canada in North America, which is, is, is it's a similar sentence, but it's not the answer. And so, yeah, I see a lot of more answers that, that here that are in the chat that are, that are correct. Um, once it's uh, similar, it's not relevant, which actually is, 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 is good because uh, relevance is what we're looking for. Um, and so at the end of the day, what I want is if something's an answer, not if something is similar. So what do we do? We get to re-ranking. So re-ranking is how we solve this problem or, or how we improve it a lot. And basically the idea is this. The idea is that maybe the answer is not the most similar sentence, but if I pick the 100 most similar sentence, chances are the answer is there. So if I go from there, then I can, uh, there's a, an endpoint that we have called re-ranking, which gives it a relevant score. It takes pairs, question, answer, and gives it high relevant scores if they're similar and low relevant scores if they are, if they are, are different. Uh, Jorge says like Watson in Jeopardy. Yeah, maybe that's, uh, is that how it works? That's, that's, that's cool. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, so therefore, uh, the, the re-ranking assigns high relevant scores to pairs where the question, where the answer is very relevant to the question and it works really well. It, uh, here, it assigned the highest relevant score to the actual answer. So what we do is we use semantic search or keyword search to surface a bunch of, of potential answers and then use re-rank to, to, to rank them and, and pick the best ones out of there. Um, and that's also a line of code. Co.re-rank, uh, then you put the query as a, as, a, as a string and then a list of the documents. Could be answers, could be longer pieces of text, uh, etc., and then it it re-ranks them all. And when you combine these two, you get uh, you get semantic search. So you first do dense retrieval, and then do re-ranking. Of course, you can use anything for dense retrieval. You don't have to use uh, you, for the search part. You can use keyword search, right? You can use any any okay search you have, and then improve it with um, with uh, re, with re-ranking. Um, I get this this question often, which is um, why don't you just use re-ranking from the beginning, right? Why don't I just re-rank everything? And the question, the answer is that re-rank is more expensive and, and slower. So if what I have to do is get uh, the get uh, surface the best ones and then re-rank a small set, a thousand or a hundred, and, and that works works much better. Uh, all right. So um, I'm gonna maybe take a little pause and see if there's any any questions because I'm gonna switch topics. Oh, and in, in case you have the question of you know how do we how do we um, uh, uh, train this model? It's it's basically a big neural network that you train with pairs that are question and correct answer and give them a high score, and pairs that are question and wrong answer, and you try to trick it by by saying similar questions, similar answers that are wrong and then train them to give low scores. And this actual model really works works really well. Um, it's a lot going on in the background. Uh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do the, the questions a little later and I'll, I'll go here because I'm, I'm close to running out of time. Uh, here is a question for you. So we saw, we saw chatbots, right? And we saw uh, search. And now the question is, what is a common problem that chatbots have? So I'm going to let you put things in the in the chat. 
Um, I'm going to repeat this answer uh, Gary asks. How, how does the re-ranking algorithm uh, work and is re-ranking a human task? Uh, the human, the, the humans definitely input stuff. Like you, you get a curated data set of question answers that are good and question answers that are bad. And with these two huge curated data sets, you train a big, big model to assign high scores to good pairs and low scores to bad pairs. That's pretty much the, um, the, um, uh, way to train a re-ranking model. I start seeing answers from several people who say that the big problem is hallucinations, right? They don't understand, they, they don't say the truth. They say a lot of, yeah, a, a lot of, um, a lot of wrong things. Basically this, these things can talk really well, but uh, they many times don't tell you the truth, right? They make stuff up and uh, it's dangerous because they're very confident, right? They're like that confident friend that we have that doesn't ne necessarily know a lot of stuff, but they're always confident with the answers and explain stuff very, uh, very uh, with, 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 high, uh, with high confidence, but they don't say the right thing and that, and that can be a problem, right? So the question is, how could we fix that? Can anybody help me fix that problem? Like, how could we help that friend? We have a friend that likes to answer questions, but doesn't know everything. How do we help that friend uh, answer questions more correctly? Let's see. Yeah, correctly, it's, it's confidently wrong. Uh, how would you, how would you fix, how would you try to help a model to not hallucinate more? And Srikant has the answer, it's RAG. Uh, our LHF works too, yeah, to, 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 to train the models. This is how the models get trained, but, uh, more, more, um, yeah, very fine asking again. Yeah. Lower the temperature, prompt exchange. Yeah. There's a lot of things. Confidence score could work really well. Um, asked a friend a thousand times. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, yeah gets free from using. Okay. I see a lot of great answers. I'm going to tell you one, uh, which was mentioned here, which is, is RAG. Uh, RAG is uh, retrieval augmented generation. And it really says you first search and then answer from there. So you're, you're ultra confident friend. You ask them a question and you say, but don't, don't answer this question. Here's a book. And there's in this chapter, there's the answer. So answer my question based on what you read from this chapter. And that's it. Don't answer anymore. Just from there. Uh, and that actually works pretty well. Uh, so that's, that's retrieval augmented generation. So here, a small, a small exercise is very easy. If I were to ask a model a question, who won the UEFA Champions League in 2021? That's question one. And question two is, who won the UEFA Champions League in 2021? But I'm also going to give you a paragraph where the answer lies there. Which one of these two is a better prompt for the model to be able to answer? Prompt one or prompt two? And... Uh, I think I, we already answered that question, right? It would be it would be prompt two because it's much better to ask the question and give it somewhere where the answer lies within. And so it's question two as as people are already starting to to reply. Um, and that's what happens, right? Because if I try to store information in a in a model, that's not good. Like these models know how to talk. They know how to pick up things like sentiment or sarcasm or anything like that, but they don't know how to store information. Storing information in the, in the, in the nodes of a neural network, storing dates and, and, and places and stuff like that is, is not the most reliable. So you wouldn't want to store it in the neural network. You'd rather have the neural network focus on talking and following orders and, and following commands and have the world information somewhere else and look for it in the database. And how do you look for it? Well, with search. So if you combine search and uh, and a language model that talks, you would have a much better model that doesn't hallucinate. Uh, here, I'm going to give you a, a, um, a demo of, of Coral, which is what it does, right? Like it, uh, it basically answers the questions from search and it gives references. So it says, actually, from here, this came out from this link and that came from that link, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, but before I give you the demo, uh, now I can go back and be like, okay, this is, this is what I mentioned first, right? That go here has a bunch of models. Half of them go for generation and half of them go for, uh, understanding, which is embeddings. 
And uh, what do we talk about today? We talked about generate and chat, which are the chat bot, right? The, the generating model. We didn't talk about summarize, but it's a model that takes a big text and summarizes into something smaller. Chat plus rag is the one that searches and then and then responds. Uh, we didn't talk about cluster classified, but we did talk about embeddings and re-rank. So basically, feel free to play with the playground. I'll give you the link pretty soon. Uh, and 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 the demo I'm going to give you is, is Coral, which is the sort of the chat, um, the, the the chat uh, endpoint. Uh, so let's do let's do a quick demo. Uh, so let me show you. You go to the cohere. You go to the dashboard at uh, at cohere, and then I can I can put a lot of sentences here, but I'm gonna just take a, a pre a preloaded data set of subreddit titles, and I'm gonna say embed, and it just embeds them here. It always does something different, and it, it embeds it in two dimensions. But in reality, it's in a thousand twenty-four, or perhaps even more. Uh, but it brings it down to two. So as you can see over here, I have some news about Queen Elizabeth and England. Over here, I have some politics, uh, European. Uh, here, I have some things with oil. Uh, as you can see, like they they go, you know, similar things go to similar places. These are more like family questions, etc. So that's embed, and uh, I also want to show you Coral. So let's actually do a a live question, something very recent. Let's say, uh, who won the rugby, the twenty twenty three rugby World Cup? I, I I don't know a ton about rugby, but I do know one so and it's something pretty recent so it's something that if i here's where i say augment it with web search or don't so if i don't augment it with web search uh it doesn't know right it says have not been determined the terminal hasn't hasn't taken place yet uh it doesn't really know because it's too recent uh and sometimes it will say i don't know sometimes you'll make up some answer say something completely wrong but now let's do the same thing but instead we say well now I want you to use web search. So first search on Google and then answer the question. And when we do this, then it says, there you go. It has, it has, it has the, uh, the correct uh, answer. And it also gave me links. So I look at this and it tells me, um, it, it, tells, it tells me in a, where where it found it in the links in the SBN or something, and I can ask some more. Where was the game played? And it will tell me, right? Come on. Actually, is that true? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so that's that's the idea, right? It tells me where. It it tells me uh, what links it came from, so it, it shows it works. So it it reduces hallucination a lot. So that's that's what Rag does. Um, I think that's all that's all for that I'm gonna tell you today. So before I'm gonna give you some resources if you're interested in more stuff. Um, if you want to learn more about this, I super highly recommend you a course that we are building at, that we build at Cohere. It's called LLM University. It's a, a team of, of content developers uh, that are, uh, are great. I love learning from them. And uh, this is a pretty comprehensive course. LLM.university is the um, is the link i'm gonna put it here llm.university uh check it out it's got it's got everything uh code labs uh have prompt engineering search it has uh how do llms work all the stuff um also we have the cohere blog check out the the blog i write stuff there often and there's some great uh, great updates there uh the dashboard i already mentioned uh with coral uh, that you can you can go in and make an account and, and play with it. You can also have a trial key if you want to get the API account and uh, the, get the the account for doing API calls. So I highly recommend it. The API the, the trial has a lot of uh, a, um, a, a lot of keys you can you can use a lot of API calls. Uh, definitely, if you haven't, please check out my channel Serrano Academy. I have a lot of videos, especially the one on Transformers that I just dropped in this morning. Um, these are a bunch of a bunch of these I have on attention mechanisms, etc. So definitely check it out. Uh, and my colleague Jay Alamar has an amazing blog where he has a lot of articles about transformers. Definitely check that one out. That's where I go to learn transformers. 
So uh, yeah, I think uh, that that's all I have. So thank you very much. And I'm taking questions. And I know uh, Salwa has, I think you yes. have with, uh, with future events. Do you want to? Yeah, I do here? have some future events. So uh, yeah. let's throw that up. And what we have here are some workshops that are coming up with Fourth Brain in this upcoming month. And you'll see the dates right here. One is building generative AI applications that is conducted over two days, three hours each. And then we have one that is kind of top of mind. We've heard from a lot of people ask about this. And after I get through the slide, um, Luis, I'm going to kick us off with questions around this is about using proprietary data. So essentially security and privacy around data and using public LMMs or open source models. Um, that's on November 10th. Um, LineChain, we're doing one that's building your chat GPT for your own data using LineChain. That's coming up on the 13th. So you can see quite a few. The building generative AI one is the most, uh, is the closest one that's coming up literally next week. And then we also do a workshop. This is actually not super technical. It's meant for executives and leaders who are thinking about how to apply generative AI to their businesses and whether that's to um, develop more AI first products or to think about operational excellence and efficiency. And that's coming up on December 1 and 8, which again is three hours each and split over, um, over two weeks. So yeah, we'll keep the slide up here for a little bit if people want to check it out. You can also go to our link under programs and see all of these upcoming workshops. Um, thank you so much, Luis. This was super thank informative, you. very knowledgeable. I always learn something from your talks. Um, so I wanted to kick us off and you can see like there's quite a few questions and comments coming in. So we'll keep them coming. We have a few kind of, don't worry if you've asked those questions prior, we did start them and I have them in a section for you, uh, Luis. But I wanted to kick us off to ask your opinion around this concern that a lot of, whether it's individuals or companies or now the generative AI is a little bit more mainstream, there are organizations, whether it's law firms, pharmaceuticals, biomedical, that are thinking about, okay, we want to use this, but what do we do about um, data privacy and security, especially if they're mm -hmm. using their own data and they're trying to use LLM. So how would you advise folks to get started or how should they just think about um, security and privacy when it comes to using LLMs? Yeah, definitely security and privacy are the most important. Uh, that that and, and, and fairness and, and, and you know, bias and things like that. Uh, those are the main main concerns. Uh, in terms of security, uh, we're very like focused on that. So we actually have like these, these models can actually be uh, deployed on any cloud environment and it can be deployed privately. So if a company has a, a their own stuff on AWS or Google Cloud or something, they can actually see the models, they can actually use use the models in, in that cloud. And it's very important that like we don't see your data or uh, mm -hmm. so so yeah, I mean I would say that the, the biggest the, the response of, I would say that for any for anything that in LLMs, the responsibility sort of falls on everybody. The people building the models, like Cohere or, or these companies, they have to make sure that your data is private and, and not seen by them or, or and nobody else, right? Mm -hmm. And then the people building apps and, and building models also have to have a, a responsibility of, of keeping this data private. private. Um, but yeah, I mean, as long as, as, as long as you have an environment where, where where it's where the model is run privately in your cloud, that, that mm -hmm. I would say is the best thing. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna pick out a couple of questions here that have come in over time. So they may seem a little out of order. Um, mm -hmm. One question from Garib was around, how does the re-ranking algorithm work? Yeah, so how how it uh, how it works, like how do you, how, for serving is very simple. Um, I just put in a, a question as a string and then a list of strings that are the documents and it's just gonna return the uh, relevant score for each pair question answer and then i just take the biggest ones uh and and very likely the answer is gonna be there so serving very very easy to use uh, as an endpoint and as for training yeah you, you have to do is you you take a a, a large data set of, of correct question answers and a, and a large data set of, of incorrect question answers 
uh, and try to make it very tricky, right? Try to make it so that the, the question answers are very close, but they're still incorrect. And then train those to give very low scores and train the correct pairs to give very high scores. And uh, like, like as mysteriously as big neural networks are, it, it starts picking up what's correct and what's not. Uh, and it works really well. Um, that's pretty much the, how, how it works. There's other methods too. I mean, you can also mess with the embedding a little bit. You can, you can, you can take post train your embedding to like, you know, correct pairs get closer and correct pairs get farther. So many things you can do, but we've seen that re-rank is just so simple and works so well that just kind mm -hmm. of go with it. So kind of following along, I know someone here, Dr. T asked this, asked a couple of questions, but I'm going to use the one that came up a, a few times, is how do you tell the model where the answers are? And then how do you get the answers to, to actually provide to the model? How do you tell the model where the answer? Oh, okay, okay, great. Yes. Um, I mean, normally, uh, th this, could, this could be as big as like search on Google or search on Wikipedia, uh, in which case you just let it let it do all the search and then and then from there pick the answers um but a lot of these things are used privately right like if you have a bunch of instruction manuals in your company and you want to chat about that only answers about those and then if you say anything else it just says i don't know the answer then you can restrict to your domain right and there's two things you can do right there's two things you can do let's say you're a company and you have uh yeah a bunch of pdfs a bunch of of things to manuals to, to answer questions. So you can take a transformer model and post train it with your data. So you can you can over train it with only your data and that will make it better to answer questions for your data. But then you also make it search on your data before you get a question. Like when you, when you get a question, you first search it and then give the model the question and a bunch of places where the answer could be and they say answer from here and that we've seen that is the best the best results so basically you decide where the data comes in you decide from where do you want uh the answers to come uh normally from the database that you have great um i'll ask one more kind of technical specific question and then there's some that are about education which i know you and i both really I, care I was about hoping so you gonna... pick, you pick those i know you'll pick those yeah. too yeah so, so i'm gonna say one <laughs> for the end but i'll ask one right now what is how what do you think about using llms in educational technology i love it i i absolutely love it i mean i think anything that helps education of course we have to make sure it's it's accurate uh but i think it's i think it's wonderful to have a tutor that can answer questions all the time and we you still have the human model right you still you still have the human helping out but for a human not to like repeat the same answer many times you can serve a lot more people you can so like uh, the tutoring applications yes yeah, tutoring applications and and a lot more stuff i mean there's there's i've seen companies that like you know pair tutors with with students using AI. There's so many things. Actually, you know so much more about this than me. Why don't you? <laughs> the possibility <laughs> with scale is like very exciting to me, I think. And yeah. then the other things that I've seen that are kind of new coming up are around this idea of uh, coaching. And I say coaching with, with air quotes because it can be anything from career coaching, um, other types of coaching. So, because pairing up mentors and coaching, as you said, it, it's one of the hardest, I think, things to do in education. So the possibility of scale there is pretty exciting. Okay, I'm yeah. gonna jump back into another technical question. For a generalist search engine, since that was the thing we were demoing, the curated data set should be done all on human knowledge. How does it work in practice? For the training, yes. I mean. I would say even more than just search, like for training these models, um, first you train them on the internet, uh, but then that's pretty, like the internet's all got all over, you know, knowledge, but it's also got a lot of wrong stuff, you know, so you, you need to train, like post train things on, on curated data sets. And these are basically done by humans. And that's where the most, I would say one of the most expensive parts of training an, an, uh, a large language model are, which is in creating all this uh, correct data. Uh, which can be like data of questions answers. It can be data of like commands and like and 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 the, and, and doing the command right. Like, do give me a, this and then it does it uh, or chats. Uh, so yeah, create. You have to create 
you have you have to use you have to uh like uh create all these data sets and they're and they're created by humans and sometimes you know humans that know a lot about a certain certain topics it's created by experts um and then you would use things like uh, uh reinforcement learning uh rlhf human feedback to to be able to use that data to to train your model um did I, did I actually answer the question? I forgot what the question was. It, it was about- uh, The question was about how in practice does it work to train a curated data set on human knowledge? Yes, yes. We have lots of annotators. Uh, all, all these uh, models are trained with lots and lots and lots of annotators. And it can be as much as like writing stuff, uh, writing the data sets. Um, but also many times like the annotator would just go and, and be clicking, right? And be like, okay, which of these two answers is better? This one, which of this one's better? This one, which one is more relevant with the question? Uh, this one. So there's there's tons and tons of, of human feedback. And as I said, uh, reinforcement learning human feedback is the, is the main model that is used to feed that information back into the model. Got it, okay. Yeah. Um, one more here. Uh, Ritesh asks, how to handle, how do you handle authenticity evaluation? Authenticity evaluation, that's a, that's a good question. What is, uh, what is that? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, uh, uh, the way I read elaborate? it was, uh, yeah, if, Ritesh, if you want to add that in, into the comment section, the way I read it is probably verifying sources, but I could be entirely wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for searching, uh, verifying sources, web searches. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Got it, got it, web got it. So when, yeah, when you do a search on a web and then it's yeah. wrong. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think, you you know, you try to restrict, we try to restrict the search. As you see, as you see the sports questions I asked, it only picked up from ESPN, right? Like it, it didn't pick up. Uh, from from other places, so I think you you can sort of curate your sources to say what is uh, more things that you trust more. Like Wikipedia would be something I trust more. Um, at the same time, you know, if I like, it's like we're doing Google, right? Like when we do a Google search, uh, maybe we don't believe some of the entries, but if we kind of look at all of them, the, the truth probably appears more. So you can also do a, a so you can do qualitative things, which is like. Mm -hmm pick good sources and you can do quantitative things to see, well, you know, this answer got appeared a lot more than this one. So it, it, mm -hmm. it may be right, but yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. I mean, data is always the biggest challenge, right? Like the right. data, when data is awful, mm -hmm. whatever beautiful your model is, it's mm -hmm. going to come out with, with problems. So a, right. a lot of questions is go look at the data. Yeah. And it's also like one of the things I've noticed is it's created an opportunity to kind of uh, come up with products that are domain specific. So for example, mm -hmm in the legal realm, right? Sources matter for them. Okay. Um, so you can't just go use a public source, a public model that's using all of the data on the internet. So there mm -hmm. are products or vendors coming out with these where they verify the underlying resource and then it's literally uh, marketed as a reliable product because the underlying yeah. sources are vetted. And that's a lot of work. Uh, not yeah. the ideal way to do it, but it does create opportunity for those kind of like domain specific products where the um, yeah. information sources are vetted. Um, yeah. And as an individual as well, like I would say nobody should go ask the model something and then go trust it completely. Like I've seen problems of like lawyers who use who use this these models for something and, and they yeah. give very confident but wrong answers. Even myself, like I would, I would always verify it. I use it for my videos as well. Sometimes I say, you know, help me explain this, help me check this, and it's sometimes tell me like wrong things that I <laughs> that I am close to close to putting there because it. Uh, you just as a, as a human, as a user, mm -hmm. always take everything it tells you with a grain of salt and go verify it somewhere else. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we'll take two more questions. So one is, what factors should be considered when choosing a vector database? And what are the pros and cons of using these frameworks? Vector databases are very, very good. And just to give people the idea that basically when I when I said search, when I said uh, put things in the embedding and search for the closest thing, I threw a lot under the rug because um, if you have a billion uh, points and you put them in a thousand dimensional space and then find the closest point somewhere, it's not easy. If you're looking at it, like I can say, well, yeah, this is closer than this. 
But if you don't, you have to actually have to look at all the points and compare the distance with all of them and then sort them. It's a very slow process to find the nearest neighbor, the, the closest sentence to something. It's a very expensive process. Uh, thank God for, for vector databases. Um, so they, um, yeah, so uh, they, they first of all store things very well. Like, so they store all your data and they also do a really fast and uh, ne nearest neighbors search because it doesn't have to search all of it. It does like smart things so that it, it doesn't have to go through everything to actually search it. It, it, it stores it in the right way and has some fast algorithms. Um, so I would say two things in a vector database is, you know, how well, how well it stores stuff and how fast it retrieves, how fast it does, um, how fast it can do, um, uh, neural uh, nearest neighbor search. So yeah, I mean, I, I like a bunch of them, you know, we 8 is pretty good. Um, like launching, I don't know if it has, like, look, the stuff is pretty, I use, I use some, some of the pretty good ones. Um, but yeah, maybe you can try, try different and see which one gives you a better, a better search, uh, results. Great. All right. So I'm going to end on this one because I think this is going to be a favorite question for both you and I. And Ray, thank yeah. you for asking this question. I'm glad to see this because this came up. I was on a panel last week about the future of work and teaching AI skills. And this came up quite a bit during that panel, too. So there's a lot of discussion in the developer community that machine learning and LLM engineers are transforming into AI engineers. And it's said that in future, people may not start with attention. Attention is all you need. Thoughts around this. So say the, the last thing again, please. Uh, uh, what is the I attention is all you need? That the paper or? May not start with attention is all you need. That's, That's a paper. Point. That is, yeah. Yeah. So thoughts around it. And it's also kind of asking around like moving from a machine learning engineer into yeah. an AI engineer. And I'm yeah. adding a little bit of color myself here too, is the questions I have seen around is, what does it mean to be an AI engineer and how is that different? Yeah, I think you remember you and I maybe eight years ago at Udacity trying to question you what, what is a data scientist, right? I think that, right. that question always always works and I think everything changes and, and whatever predictions I make, maybe somebody will get this recording. I'll be like, look, you were completely wrong. Um, but I, I, I think uh, this, this keeps evolving. This, this drops keep evolving. And at the end of the day, you know, AI engineer, machine learning engineer, data scientist is just somebody who knows how to handle data, right? Like it's somebody who knows how to predict things, uh, how to see trends in data and predict things for others and uh, other data points and, and infer, infer from there. Um, and things change. I mean, I, I think uh, like, like concept wise, <clears throat> I don't see things changing that much, but like, like syntax wise, I, I see, for example, uh, Prompt engineer gets more and more uh, trendy now because uh, what what I think is that people will code less because these these models code now can you know the, the communication with the computer is is now easier so I can actually talk to the computer and tell it what to do as opposed to writing code so that's that's more before and before people had to use assembly and punch cards you know so it just the communication with the computer just becomes more and more natural with every generation. And what I think, and I may be wrong, but what I think is that probably the next generation is not going to have to write code, but it's still going to have to have the high level understanding of, mm -hmm. of how computers work and how models work and how data works. So I think, I think the next generation of data scientists is, is going to be more of that. It's going to be more involved in like, you know, what the problem is, how do I solve it with data and et cetera. And the, and the syntax is going to be less, less of the, of the roadblock. But what do you think? Yeah, a lot of, I think, these tools, what is helping us do is it's almost moving the starting point or accelerating things, right? So before, if you had to like really sit down and start from scratch with every line of code, that's already moved up. And this is just taking it further. So mm -hmm. what that means for us, I think, as learners is it moves we're just gonna be able to accomplish so much more because the mm -hmm. starting point has moved up. Exactly. The other evolution I think um, that happens is it's hard to kind of see because it happens the evolution, like things change so frequently, but we've noticed this even within our fourth brain programs is the need for continuous education is getting redefined, right? Um, it's not this 
department at a university that no one looks at. That's what continuous education used to be, right? That's not <laughs> what it is anymore. Um, like we've moved from having these three, four month long programs or having these alternate credentials boot camps to having one day, three day, one week workshops, right? And and I, we see a lot of repeat students. So this, and it came from our students and graduates essentially telling us that, hey, I don't have time to like carve out three months and then things move too fast and change. I need more shorter upskilling mm -hmm. that keeps happening. So I think that's mm -hmm. going to be a big part of, and one of the reasons I think we see these roles getting redefined or the titles kind of becoming nebulous to some degree is People just have to get started, you just to get started, mm -hmm. whether it's if you have one day, half a day, that's what you do. And then maybe you mm -hmm. have a week at some other point. But and the, the upskilling, I think, is also not going to be for new roles. Right. It's not like, oh, I'm in this role right now. I want a new job. I take a course and then go do it. You need upskilling in your existing jobs, right, mm -hmm. in your existing role. Um, yeah. So that's going to be important as well. Absolutely. If I if I may, and yeah, that's a that's a great point uh, because things change so much that you know whatever we'd be doing in five years, ten years, maybe doesn't exist now. So you, you have to right. constantly learn. I think the previous generations who were you know were able to learn on, until they were like twenty two and then start working for the rest of their life, like that right. that doesn't work anymore. And I'm glad it doesn't because that's right. that's awful. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's good that arbitrary. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we have to be learning constantly and for content creators like, like you and i right like we we have to build this stuff faster because if i start building a, a course in large language models and it takes me one year in a year it's irrelevant so it's you gotta build right. chunker smaller smaller chunks mm -hmm. and be constantly learning i'm always taking courses i'm always doing stuff i'm just it's mm -hmm. actually fun i mean you know yeah. can't, can't fall behind every, we're all kind of catching up so i think it's yes. It forces it to be fun. It can't, it can't be boring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That is so true. Well, thank you so much, Luis, for joining us. I know we all enjoyed the conversation and it was really nice to see an active kind of chat um, going on. We'd love to have you back at some point and I know we'll keep working together and talking. And thank you to everyone joining from all corners of the world, it looked like. Everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm always a big fan of Fourth Brain and, and what you do. And uh, so, yeah, happy to, to be here. And thank you for everybody. There was a, such a lively chat and so many questions and, and so many answers to my questions. So thank you to everybody who was, who was here for, for making this very lively. Thank you. Great. Have a good day, everyone.